This is my video update on this Thursday midday, December the 7th. Let's talk about some news. And uh, we've got helicopters in the air. We've got parakeets everywhere on this Thursday in Athens. So let's uh, let's try to get through this this news update. And let's start things off with a story that is not really being reported on much. And it's a big uh, a big story. And that is the United Nations invoking Article 99 of the UN Charter, urging the Security Council to help avert a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Now, Article 99 is rarely used in the UN, if ever. I've read reports which say that Article 99 has never been used, but I've also read reports saying that it's been 30 years since Article 99 was uh, invoked. Either way, it's very rare for the UN, for uh, se the Secretary General, Guterres to invoke Article 99, appealing for a humanitarian ceasefire. Guterres says the civilian population must be spared from further harm. This is from a letter that he sent out to members of the United Nations and members of the Security Council. And basically what this is, is, uh, is a panic button that uh, the UN Secretary General has decided to push. And with this panic button, from what I understand, it gives uh, the UN power to, to put resolutions towards the Security Council and to, to force or to, to try and force the UN Security Council towards a resolution which would call for a ceasefire in Gaza. And of course, in the UN Security Council, the US has uh, a veto with any resolution, but, but with this Article 99, it gives, it gives the UN more, uh, more power to force the US's hand to vote yes to a ceasefire. That's basically what, uh, what this does. And, and it also gives the UN the power to, to actually take things a step further and to even be able to to place uh, peacekeepers in, uh, in a conflict zone. So it gives the UN quite a lot of uh, power, this Article 99. So this is a big deal, the fact that uh, Guterres has actually invoked this, uh, this article. And at the same time that Guterres invoked Article 99, we have the United Arab Emirates submitting a draft resolution to the Security Council calling for a humanitarian ceasefire resolution to be adopted urgently. So as Guterres invokes Article 99, pushing the UN Security Council to get to a ceasefire, you have the UAE putting on the table a draft resolution calling for a ceasefire to the UN Security Council. Now, what world leader visited the UAE just yesterday? What president of a country on the UN Security Council was in the UAE yesterday? That would be one Russian president, Vladimir Putin. So uh, the UN is, is, pushing, is pushing very, very hard. Towards, uh, towards a ceasefire, very aggressively, I think now, towards uh, forcing the U.S.'s hand to approve a ceasefire resolution in the United Nations. And the U.S., they obviously understand this. They know that this is where things are heading towards. And I imagine it would be very, very embarrassing for the Biden White House to be forced to vote yes for a ceasefire with uh, this war in Israel and Gaza, given the fact that the Biden White House has, uh, 
has been one of the few countries at this moment in time, if not the only country, it seems. Even the EU has disappeared. Even EU member states have disappeared. But the U.S. seems to be the only country at this moment that is, uh, that is supporting Israel and what is happening in this war. Even the U.K. has kind of, kind of uh, walked back much of its support, at least the Labour Party is definitely walking back its support of uh, Israel. So the U.S. is in a very uh, isolated position, and it would be very embarrassing if they were forced to vote yes to, uh, to a ceasefire in the U.S. Security Council, and they know this, and that is why you are getting more reports which claim that the Biden White House is pressing the government of Netanyahu to de-escalate, to de-escalate its military activity in Gaza. CNN is actually reporting that the Biden White House is pushing the government of Netanyahu to end its ground operations in Gaza by next month. Israel Defense Forces military activity may shift to a lower intensity strategy that narrowly targets specific Hamas operatives and leaders in January, CNN has reported. According to CNN, the tactics of the operation would be similar to the U.S. campaign against terrorist leaders in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the same time, Washington is deeply concerned about further Israeli operations in southern Gaza. The U.S. has warned West Jerusalem in hard and direct talks that the IDF cannot repeat the same destructive tactics it used in the north of the Palestinian enclave and must do more to limit civilian casualties, CNN said on Tuesday, citing a number of unnamed senior U.S. officials. So this is where we're heading towards over the next month, over the month of December. It seems that either the U.N. will have to pass a resolution Eventually, they will have to pass a resolution calling for a ceasefire, which will be enforced because of Article 99. The UN will then have power to actually enforce the ceasefire. The U.S. will have to vote in favor of the ceasefire or the U.S. before they get to. Wow. <laughs> Those pigeons came at me. <laughs> Those people were like, Phew. Uh, or the or the U.S. in order to avoid having to vote yes for a ceasefire, they will figure out a way to get the government of Benjamin Netanyahu to uh, de-escalate in a big, big way. So that's that's where we're heading towards. That's where it seems like we're heading towards. Of course, Netanyahu, at least uh, for the Biden White House, Netanyahu is proving to be a, a pain in the butt for uh, the Biden White House. They can't seem to get Netanyahu to uh, to agree to to any of the of the plans that they would like the Israeli military and the Israeli government to, to carry out in uh, in this operation. Netanyahu is proving to be a big problem for the Biden White House. So we'll see what will happen with Netanyahu as well. Anyway, let's now shift gears and talk about the debates in uh, the United States, the GOP debates. I think this is the final. Is this going to be the final debate for the, for the Republicans? Of course, Trump did not show up. He doesn't need to show up because Trump is like 700 points ahead of all the other candidates for the nomination of the Republican Party for the president in 2024. But uh, you had in attendance Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, DeSantis, and uh, Chris Christie. What is Christie doing there? He, he, he's just there to, to bash on Trump. That's what he's been tasked with. But uh, Vivek. Vivek won this one. <laughs> Vivek won this debate again. He was... Wow, Vivek was, was on fire. <laughs> I mean, he was attacking Nikki Haley. And uh, it was effective. It was really, really effective. I, I have to say, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, he's, <laughs> he's saying stuff that 
I don't even think Trump has said. I mean, he is saying stuff that is that I mean, you just don't say if you're part of the the U.S. Uh, political class. But I guess that's the point. Vivek is is making a point, saying he's not part of the U.S. deep state globalist neocon neolib political class, and that's why he's saying these things. Wow, did he say some some amazing stuff? Uh, go on to Twitter, go on to tele, Telegram, and uh, you'll you'll see what I mean. Vivek said stuff that you just don't talk about. Connected to to J six, connected to immigration connected to warmongering and uh, a lot of that stuff was directed at Nikki Haley uh, Vivek actually <laughs> he actually said that Nikki Haley knows nothing about foreign policy she knows zero zilch nada about uh, foreign policy and uh, he actually challenged Nikki Haley to name three regions three provinces in uh, Ukraine and Nikki Haley's face was just blank because, you know, she can't name three provinces in Ukraine. That's what he actually uh, told her. He's like, name three provinces in Ukraine, three regions in Ukraine. And uh, he said, you know, you want to send our sons and daughters to fight Russia. You want to start World War Three. You want to escalate in Ukraine. Um, and you can't even name three regions. <laughs> Nikki Haley was just like... Uh, Three regions in Ukraine. Uh, you could tell her her mind was turning. Um, Kiev, uh, Moscow, maybe, and uh, and uh, what else? Uh, Vilnius is that a region in uh, Ukraine? You know, she has no idea. Nikki Haley can't name five countries in Europe. I would put money on it that if you told Nikki Haley to name five countries in Europe, she would not be able to. Five countries in Europe. Let me think. Uh, uh, France, Spain, uh, Lisbon, <laughs> um, let me see, Warsaw, and uh, Athens. <laughs> how many? How many? How many countries did I just name? Five or six? <laughs> Oh man, Rome, Rome is, is, is it Rome, a, a country in Europe? So yeah, he called out Nikki Haley big time. Oh boy, why did Trump put Nikki Haley as, as the U.S. ambassador to the U.N.? I think the, the military industrial complex, they knew back then that Nikki Haley was going to be their candidate. She was going to succeed Trump or, or, or the person after Trump. They knew it. So they wanted to beef up her resume. So I bet you they worked out a deal with Trump and they said, look, we'll uh, we'll lay off of you. But uh, you have to you have to appoint Pompeo and Bolton and McMasters and Nikki Haley. You know, it. that's that they put pressure on Trump to, to put Nikki Haley in as a U.N. ambassador because she she's clueless when it comes to foreign policy. She's absolutely clueless. And uh, she presents herself as a foreign policy wizard, but uh, she, she has no clue. She has no clue. She probably couldn't name 10, 10 states in the United States. <laughs> I doubt she could. Anyway, uh, Vivek, he also, he also told uh, Nikki, he said, get, get this quote. He said, Nikki, I don't have a woman problem. You have a corruption problem. This is a woman who will send your kids to die so she can buy a bigger house. And then Vivek, he held up a, a note. Like, I guess he was, he was writing on his notepad. And it says, Nikki equals corrupt. And he, like, held it up. <laughs> and he's right. He's right. Because the fact is that Nikki Haley was just making, I guess she was just making an average salary. I don't know, maybe above average. But she was living a very average life. Nothing, nothing extravagant. And, uh, and all of a sudden, she became worth something like 10 or 20 million, just like that. Like within a matter of a couple of years, she became worth like 20 million bucks or 10 million bucks, which is life changing money. I mean, that's, that's going to change your life. That's going to change your kids' life. I mean, you know, 10, 20 million is, that changes, that changes everything when you get to that level. 
And uh, Vivek, he pointed that out. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think Nikki Haley has ever answered that question. How did you go from, from, I don't know, making six figures, let's say. How'd you go from six figures to becoming a multi-multi-millionaire in just a matter of a couple of years? How exactly did, did you do that? And, and Vivek was even saying that Nikki Haley has puppet masters that are pulling her strings. He's like, they're the puppet masters pulling Nikki Haley's strings. I mean, it was, wow. It was pretty incredible to, to watch. So uh, check out the, the clips from the debate and uh, specifically look for Vivek Ramaswamy because he was, he was pretty awesome. He told Chris Christie to go get a meal. He's like, what are you doing here, Chris Christie? Just leave the stage, go get a meal, and, <laughs> and leave us alone. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that was Vivek Ramaswamy. So uh, the current president of the United States, Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece is favorite son. He, uh, he made some statements yesterday urging Congress to allocate 61 billion to uh, Project Ukraine. The vote didn't pass, by the way. The Senate did not pass the 61 billion for uh, Project Ukraine, as was to be expected. But uh, they do have uh, about a week or two left to, to try and pass it. So it's not over yet. A lot can happen in, in one or two weeks. And maybe they could work out a deal to get the 61 billion passed, the, the 109 billion, the total package passed. But uh, yesterday, the Senate did not manage to, to get the 61 billion passed, even though Biden made like a last minute pledge, a last minute uh, plea, not a pledge, a plea, begging for uh, the Senate to, to approve the 61 billion for Ukraine. And Biden urged Congress to not kneecap Ukraine by not passing the 61 billion. Not giving Kiev billions would mean letting Russia win, Biden said. So uh, Biden blamed the Republicans. He's putting blame on the Republicans if the money doesn't get, get approved in the next uh, couple of weeks, which is, a, which is a pretty predictable strategy, actually. Basically, what the Biden White House, what the Democrats are doing is they're saying, look, if uh, if they don't approve the money, if they don't get the, the 109 billion, this uh, this aid package passed, then we're going to blame the Republicans for a collapse in Project Ukraine. And uh, if they do eventually approve the money, which I think they will, I think they'll get some sort of deal worked out with the southern border and eventually some money will be approved and the Biden White House, if they get money approved, then they could work towards their goal, which is to try and get Project Ukraine over the 2024 uh, finish line. That's how people like Sullivan, who's a campaign guy, that's how he sees things. I've been I've been saying this for for like nine months. Guys like Sullivan, their goal for Project Ukraine is not winning. Their goal is to try and uh, keep Ukraine afloat at least until November 2024. That's their goal. Uh, get them 60 billion, get them 50 billion, then get Alensky to just shut up, go away, uh, send Ukrainian men, women, teenagers, pensioners, send them to the front line for the next uh, one year, not even not even one year, less than a year, for the next 11 months, send them, <laughs> send them to the, <laughs> pigeons are <laughs> flying everywhere, uh, s send them to the front line and, uh, and just leave us alone so we can, we can campaign for 2024. That's, that's Sullivan's thinking on all of this. Sullivan realized nine months ago, 10 months ago, that this, this war was lost. So now he's in campaign mode. So I think that's the strategy from the Biden White House. No money, blame the Republicans. We get the money. Then let's uh, give the money to, to Project Ukraine. Let the Europeans manage Zelensky. And, uh, and we can just focus on 2024. And after 2024, they're not going to care, really. They're not going to care. But uh, kneecap. <laughs> Biden said kneecap don't uh don't kneecap ukraine 
and Biden's uh, budget budget uh, commissioner in the letter that she sent to Congress two days ago. She also urged Congress not to kneecap Ukraine. So it looks like the script writers, they have a new word, kneecap. Don't kneecap Zelensky. Let's see, Biden, uh, Biden said that Republicans are willing to literally kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield and damage our national security in the process. Biden told reporters arguing that not approving billions for Ukraine would harm Washington's global prestige and abandon global leadership. Literally, the entire world is watching. What will the U.S. do? The president said, without America to follow, the G7, the EU, and Japan may not continue back in Kiev. Biden said, we're the reason Putin has not totally overrun Ukraine. If, in fact, we walk away, how many of our European friends are going to continue to fund Kiev and at what rates? Biden said that, uh, he said, I'm not ready to walk away from Ukraine. Really, Biden, walk away? Is that the right word that you should use, that you're not ready to walk away from something? <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, a good choice of words from uh, Bidenopolis. And then Biden talked about how, uh, how if, uh, if the funding stops, then uh, Putin wins. And he, he then said that Russia is going to, to attack NATO countries. He said once uh, once they take over Ukraine, then they're going to move on to NATO countries. So Biden's argument was that uh, we have to fund Ukraine. The U.S. has to fund Ukraine in order to prevent World War III. By funding Ukraine and letting Ukrainians fight the Russians, you prevent Russia fighting NATO. Because Putin is going to, after Ukraine, is going to invade Poland and the Baltics and... France and the UK and you, you guys get the picture Spain and Portugal and so you have to have uh, you have to have the Ukrainians stop Putin in Ukraine that's the argument so they've they've used they've actually used this argument before they're recycling this this argument but uh, it's it was about democracy then it was about preventing the Russian Empire presenting the preventing the Tsar Empire then it was preventing the Soviet Empire uh, then it was about uh, international uh, law, and it was about our values and the international order. Uh, and then it was about, uh, now it's about uh, preventing a war with, uh, with NATO. And, uh, and just two days ago, it was all about uh, jobs in America, right? Austin was saying that getting $60 billion to Ukraine helps create jobs in America, and uh, Biden's budget commissioner said that uh, $61 billion to Ukraine is all about jobs in America as well. And uh, yeah, and so Biden is now back on, on NATO fighting Russia. So let Ukrainians fight Russia so NATO doesn't fight Russia. Yeah. You would think that if, if Putin really wanted to, if Russia really wanted to, uh, to invade Europe, take over NATO countries, there would be a more direct route rather than going through Ukraine, right? <laughs> you know, I would think that Russia uh, understands that, that they have very, very small, very weak um, NATO member states just right across the border from them, you know, <laughs> like in the Baltic nations. You, you would think that it would be an easier route to to taking over NATO member states rather than going through Ukraine. But, you know, that's Putin. He likes to do things the hard way. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, when, when Biden makes a statement like this, what, what, is, what does Ukraine think about this? What, what goes through, if, if the soldiers in Ukraine actually got this news of what Biden said, basically what Biden is telling the soldiers, he's basically telling the people of Ukraine, uh, destroy your country, Fight for us, fight for NATO, an alliance that doesn't even want you. That's pretty much what he's saying. Fight for NATO, even though you're not getting into NATO. Destroy yourselves so that you can protect NATO. That's basically the message that Biden is, is passing over to, uh, to Ukraine. Anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the excuse now that they're trying to, to peddle with regards to, uh, 
to Russia and, and the conflict in Ukraine and why, why Congress has to pass $61 billion to prevent World War III now. Even though Russia has been fighting proxy NATO for the last uh, year and a half, NATO's most powerful uh, military, most powerful army was in Ukraine. Most powerful European army was in Ukraine. And uh, Russia destroyed that NATO proxy, not one time, but three times. We're now on our fourth NATO proxy army that Russia's gonna have to annihilate unless Alensky gets some, uh, some common sense and decides to call up Putin and surrender, which would be the right thing for Alensky to do. Check out this, uh, this newspaper title from Il Manifesto in Italy. Fondo perduto. <laughs> and it has a picture of Alensky, very sad. We've been seeing a lot of pictures of Alensky where he's very sad, huh? In the collective West media. They're showing more and more pictures of a very sad, very panicky Alensky. But I love the title, Fondo perduto. I believe that means sunk, uh, sunk investment or lost investment in Italian. People that speak Italian, let me know if that is correct. Does it mean lost investment? I think it does. Sunk cost. Fondo perduto. So the EU is definitely panicking about Project Ukraine. And one way the EU believes that they can, they can continue to keep support for Project Ukraine as the, as the U.S. is debating whether to give $61 billion to Alensky, the EU believes that by beginning accession talks with, uh, with Ukraine, they will be able to, to keep the Alensky regime afloat just a little bit longer. And uh, they're panicking about those accession talks, which are going to be discussed, I believe, on December 14th or 15th, because Viktor Orban of Hungary has said that he will not vote for uh, Ukraine to begin accession talks into the European Union. And so EU leaders, they're trying to win over Orban now. And uh, Macron is going to be hosting Orban for a dinner, I believe tomorrow, in order to try and convince Orban to vote yes for Ukraine uh, talks to begin with the European Union. And uh, Michel, he was in Budapest last week trying to win over Orban. And word is that even Kiev, Yermak, is in talks with Peter Siarto, the foreign minister of Hungary, to arrange a meeting between Alensky and Orban to convince Orban to vote yes for accession talks between Ukraine and the European Union to begin. And all of this is about finding some sort of, uh, of hope, some sort of mechanism. As the U.S. is in doubt, U.S. support is in doubt, the EU is scrambling to find a way to prevent a collapse in Project Ukraine. So what better way than, than saying that uh, Ukraine is going to begin accession talks into the EU and eventually, over time, this will mean uh, more money and more support and maybe even open up a pathway to some sort of security or some sort of uh, NATO entrance by having these accession talks with the EU take place. This is, this is the EU's final bet on Project Ukraine, on keeping Project Ukraine afloat. Of course, the irony in all of this is that by, by admitting Ukraine into the European Union, you effectively destroy the European Union. The European Union is finished because the EU, there is no way that the EU can support, can subsidize Ukraine and Moldova at the same time. It is not going to happen. There is one other possible, possible development that could provide the collective West, West with some hope for Project Ukraine, and that is the whole F-16 thing. There are reports claiming that the F-16s will be ready to go to take on the Russian military 
in the first quarter of 2024. The, uh, the pilots, the Ukraine pilots, will have learned English and they will have learned the ins and outs of the F-16s and they will be ready to do battle with Russian fighter jets and it's not going to be good for Ukraine pilots but the F-16 issue is starting to bubble up again and provide some hope for the collective West but uh, Maria Zaharova, she came out with a statement yesterday, the foreign ministry spokeswoman and she said that uh, if F-16s are used in this conflict, well, then the Russians will consider those F-16s as legitimate targets. Also, the F-16s taking off from runways, from airfields outside of Ukraine. And that's the key part to Zakharova's statement. NATO warplanes legitimate targets over Ukraine. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Zaharova suggested that F-16 fighters provided to Kiev could fly from within the military bloc's borders. Russia will not hesitate to destroy U.S.-made F-16 jets sent to Kiev, even if they operate from bases outside Ukraine. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zaharova has warned The spokeswoman pointed out that a significant part of Ukraine's airfield infrastructure has been destroyed and those American fighters may be operating from airfields outside the country, including in Poland, Slovakia and Romania. The Russian armed forces will consider fighters participating in the conflict on the side of the Ukrainian military as legitimate targets to be destroyed. So it's hard to get a clear understanding if Zaharova means that the Russians will actually target airfields in Poland, Slovakia, and Romania. She kind of leaves it a little bit open, but uh, I do get a sense that what Zaharova is saying in this statement is that uh, these F-16s are not going to be piloted or won't exclusively be piloted by Ukrainian pilots. There's going to be NATO pilots in these F-16s, and the Russians will shoot down these F-16s with NATO pilots uh, in them. That's the sense of what I got from her statement. The Russian armed forces will consider fighters participating in the conflict on the side of Ukrainian military as legitimate targets to be destroyed. So the, the big risk, the big escalation is hitting airfields in NATO that are being used to attack the Russian military. That's a huge escalation, but I think the Russians are leaving it very open. That's the way it looks. But uh, more to the point, to Zaharova's statement, is that uh, they're not fooled. The Russians aren't fooled. The Ukrainian pilots are not going to be trained to the level to uh, engage in combat combat with Russian pilots. And so there's going to be NATO pilots in these F-16s, and the Russians are going to destroy these F-16s with NATO pilots in them. So that's an interesting statement from Zaharova. How am I doing on time here? All right, so we had the trip from Putin to the UAE and to Saudi Arabia. What a welcome Putin received at the UAE. What a welcome he received there. And uh, what a what a welcome he had to uh, Saudi Arabia. The handshake with MBS. You know that they're, uh, you know, they're good friends. You can tell that they get along really, really well. Putin and MBS, the isolated Mr. Putin. The Putin is so isolated that he got quite a welcome when he arrived at the UAE and quite uh, a handshake with MBS. I believe the German president, when he arrived at, uh, in the UAE, there was no one at the airport to even greet him. (laughs) <laughs> no one was even there, and he had to like stay in the plane until, until the UAE sent some sort of official there to greet the German president. And the Russian president arrives, and it's like fighter jets with the colors of the, of the Russian flag. And, I mean, just, just an incredible welcome to, uh, to the Russian president. So uh, check out the, the videos on, on Twitter and on uh, Telegram, and it's, it's pretty incredible to see the... Uh, the respect that these countries have for 
uh, Russia and for Russian President Vladimir Putin. This has got to be freaking out the collective West and the globalists. Russia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, BRICS, Brazil and OPEC plus, Nigeria saying that they're going to enter BRICS in two years. The world is definitely changing. And, um, and Putin, as he was flying to the UAE and to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, he was escorted by a whole bunch of, uh, of fighter jets, SU-35s, I believe. And uh, these fighter jets were, were fully equipped and ready to do battle if uh, they needed to. And uh, this confirms much of what, uh, what I've been talking about, what we've been talking about on the Duran with regards to Putin and his traveling and the whole ICC arrest warrant, uh, the panic that, uh, that grips the collective West at the moment as they see their entire uh, Project Ukraine collapsing, their entire unipolar um, rule collapsing. The, the fact that Putin was traveling with all of these fighter jets escorting his plane is, is all about the, the possibility that the collective West would absolutely shoot down Putin's plane or bring Putin's plane to the ground if uh, they were able to do so. And this is analysis that we've been talking about on this channel and on the Duran. It wasn't so much, for example, traveling to, to South Africa wasn't so much about Putin being in South Africa and worrying about some sort of ICC arrest. It was, it was the trip. It was traveling that distance to South Africa. That was the big worry. And I think I've, I, I said this on, on a video when I was talking about the BRICS summit in South Africa. It wasn't so much Putin in South Africa that concerned the Russians. It was, it was the fact that he would be flying to South Africa a long distance and uh, the collective West would have no problem trying to, to take Putin out or to bring his plane down, to escort it down or do something as he was traveling to South Africa. And I think you saw this in, uh, in his trip to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. It's a shorter distance, but the Russians are absolutely concerned about the craziness in uh, the collective West, which would bring them to even, even take action against the plane carrying the president of Russia. Look what they did to the plane that was, uh, that was flying to, uh, to Skopje for the uh, OSCE meeting with Lavrov and Maria Zakharova. They forced that plane to detour. Look what they did to, to Nord Stream. When, they, when they're in panic mode, these, these people do crazy things. So, um, oh, well, of course, Nord Stream was blown up by Zaluzhny, according to the Collective West mainstream media, but I think you all know my point. So, so yeah, he, he was escorted by, by the SU-35s, uh, and they were going, going to protect uh, the Russian president. Let's do a couple of clown worlds and we will wrap this video up. And the first clown world has to do with Forbes, a Forbes list, which names Ursula van der Leyen as the most powerful woman in the world. For a second year in a row, van der Crazy has been named the most powerful woman in the world, according to this Forbes list. And I agree. I agree. It takes a very, it takes a very special person to be able to destroy Germany, the European Union, uh, the EU economy within a year and a half. <laughs> it takes a very special person to destroy the entire, the entirety of Europe in just a year and a half. So yeah, she's, uh, <laughs> she's without a doubt the most uh, powerfully incompetent person in the world, the most, the most powerful woman in the world. That is a special superpower to be that incompetent. No doubt about it. I completely agree with you, Forbes. She is the most powerful woman in the world. The superpower of 
destruction, incompetence, devastation that is Ursula von der Leyen. And then you have Time's Person of the Year. And Putin was actually nominated for Person of the Year. The Putin was nominated for Person of the Year. But uh, the award went to, not Alensky, the award went to Taylor Swift. <laughs> I don't even... I don't even get this one. Taylor Swift was named Person of the Year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Whatever. <laughs> Taylor Swift. She's changed the world in ways that... that uh, historians will be talking about for decades and centuries to come. <laughs> Taylor Swift. I can't even name a Taylor Swift song. I don't even know any of her songs. Where, where have I been living? God, I don't know any of any of the Person of the Year songs. Anyway, Taylor Swift, Person of the Year, according to Time Magazine. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's the video. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran Shop. Twenty percent off. Use the code VDuran20. Take care.